Hello and welcome back to Dial H for Hero Clicks. I am your resident Dial H for Hero Clicks champion, current belt holder. This is episode 398. Let's go make Hero Clicks the way it should be. So if you're looking for emotional satisfaction, my advice to you is seek professional Hero Clicks. Now, are you serious? Again? How many people even play this game? Like the hundred? Instant deadpan humor. Over How they, six uh, people they think I am funny. It's a hard day's work. Not that you know anything about that. Which Absolute fools. It's not richer nonsense. I'm gonna make Hero Clicks like that forever. Are you kidding me? <laughs> hey Google, back some. Let's attack him because he's a jerk. Wow, wow, wow. Dial H for Hero Clicks is brought to you in part by CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every day, including the latest Hero Clicks singles and sealed products. The other part of Dial H for Hero Clicks is brought to you by cool listeners like yourself, uh, helping us over on Patreon and making things run a little bit smoother. So thanks to all of you. On this episode, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, some news. Scott Porter did some unboxings, and we've got a whole bunch of legacy figures to speculate about with no real information going on other than the crazy price hike. Uh, As you can tell, Calder's not joining me this week, uh, but instead, I've got somebody from the great white north of America, the, the northern America that we have up there. The great white north of America. I think yeah, that's Alaska. Like, like one of those Dakotas, right? Northeast yeah. Dakota. Uh, North Dakota too. Manitoba. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, they rhyme. It must have been... Whoever, whoever was naming stuff back then was just doing an excellent job, that's for sure. Some uh, wealthy, totally not business-minded investor who sits in government and really only cares about the lineage of his family and his pocketbook. <laughs> that's what Canada was built on. Thank you, Hudson Bay Company. Oh, there we go. Well, I'm sure that that's all true because uh, I, don't, I don't know. I've, just, I've, I've heard great things about Canada. I'm not allowed to go there, but... You know, one day they might repeal that uh, standoff order and let me enter the country once again. There was always growing up, uh, people would warn you about not saying certain things to cops if you were pulled over. Like, don't tell them you're tired and things like that, because if you wanted to cross the border, there were so many little infractions that could just prevent you from entering the states. And if you've never looked at a map, almost all of the uh, residents of Canada live within like a two hour drive of the border to the States with the exception of some really great Northern provinces and territories. And, you know, there's still lots of uh, things happening that aren't adjacent to the U S but man, oh man, the stuff that gets you kicked out of a country now, it's just, it's not like the way that it used to be. The stuff that doesn't get you kicked out of a country is all equally impressive. Uh, But Uh, it doesn't get you kicked off Twitter or, our resident and current Dial H for Heroclix super fan, Luke, how are you doing? How's it going? What made you happy this week? I'm doing all right. Um, like we mentioned, hello, Luke. Uh, up here in Canada, it's full on winter and kind of ties into what made me happy. In, um, in Winnipeg, where I call home, we have, much like Minneapolis, two rivers that intersect the city. And we have a river trail that once the river has actually frozen and is safe enough to walk and drive on, uh, we carve out a big section for skating, for walking. They set up really cool little art installation warming huts sometimes. In non-COVID times, there's even a full-on restaurant and venue and like outdoor ice bar that gets built on the river. And just having some access to that, that really nice perfect balance that goldilocks zone of cold enough to be frozen and be out on it and then also nice enough to want to go outside and not have the environment try and kill you so what made me happy lots and lots of time outside man just feels nice nice i spend plenty of time outside and i i will say this latest week was the weather was more mild uh we did get a decent amount of precipitation in the form of slushy snow rain garbage weather what would have been friday night and that ties into what made me happy because just a quick warning i'm about to go on a long tangent and talk about wwe and wrestling and stuff 
So if you're not at all interested in that, you don't want to listen to 15 minutes of it, go ahead and skip 15 minutes ahead, and we'll get on with the rest of the show for that. For the bulk of Friday, I was staring at the radar, because I had an event that I wanted to go to, and it was supposed to get, the weather was supposed to get actively worse right around the time the event would have started, and I was like, man... I'm going to I'm going to have to drive through like the worst of it. I'm going to have to find parking and I'm going to have to walk through some of the worst of it. But hopefully like the streets will be clear when I leave. And it was something that I really wanted to do. So what made me happy this week was I've been a long-time wrestling fan and uh throughout my stint of watching wrestling and you know just yada yada being a fan of it in general I've never actually gone to a live show not even like a local one not like a small one but uh never been to like a WWE show um never gone to support your (laughs) co-host no definitely not um wherever he may be stranded at because of his his big uh wrestling career that's going on right now um they don't they don't pay him the big bucks quite yet but he he is stranded I should I should mention that that also made me happy the fact that Calder is stuck in some terrible airport having to pay like twenty dollars for a Cinnabon and a orange juice right now kind of makes me happy. But <laughs> um, are there no. actual Cinnabons in the world that don't exist in airports? Yeah, uh, there's a gas station in York, Nebraska oh. that also okay. has Cinnabon. So I don't I've never seen one outside of that. But I think they exclusively exist in gas stations or airports, which are equal quality in my mind. Um, gas stations at least, have, <laughs> yeah. Gas stations at least have like the roller grills. I have yet to see an airport where you can just like grab a hot dog and like load it up, um, or like a taquito or whatever the other egg rolls. No airports have those just like sitting out on rollers all day. Surprising. You would think that you know that wouldn't be like a health issue and they would totally do it. But for whatever reason, they don't, um, but back to, back to what made me happy. Um, I don't want to get on too many tangents here. Uh, my sister got me for Christmas, uh, two tickets to what was it? Friday night Smackdown. Jeez. I don't know. I'm having such a hard time with that Friday night Smackdown, which was going to be hosted in my hometown or not hometown, but my current town, my resident town of Omaha, Nebraska. So I made the, the long and slushy trek with my car. Luckily I have decent snow tires and I definitely needed them. Um, waited in line and traffic for a very long time because parking was a nightmare as it tends to be. Uh, I got a half off apps at Applebee's coupon for paying $10 for parking. So that's, that almost pays for itself to be honest you know that ten dollar parking is definitely not a scam and then uh yeah i went and watched some wrestling for the, like the first time live ever um if you're a current fan of wrestling then i'm sorry uh it's not as exciting and great as it used to be it really it's not uh crazy but it is still really enjoyable, um, especially live. I've, I never thought that I would enjoy it as much as I did live. But the crowd chanting and swelling and booing and stuff, uh, it's just like a huge experience. It was the – so for anyone that used to watch WWE back in like the late 90s and early 2000s and knows of like the Hardy Boys, um, one of the cool things I saw was the return of Lita. She was, of course, like – one of the top women's uh, wrestling champs at the, in that time zone. Um, originally WWE started off with... Hall of Famer. Yeah, she is a WWE Hall of Famer. Um, did one of like the first women's TLC matches. Did like a lot of firsts. She was like pretty groundbreaking in her day, uh, in her own way, and a lot of like the cool high flying stuff. So I got to see her return and announce her uh, bid to be in the Royal Rumble, potentially. If she wins the ma- the Royal Rumble, she'll potentially main event at WrestleMania, which is really cool. Um, so that was really interesting. I got to see uh, the Viking Raiders, which is one of like the best tag teams that I've seen. Because for people that don't know, and again, I don't want to get too long-winded on this, Vince McMahon does not like too many strange body types. 
Uh, he likes big buff dudes that are really tall and like action figure shaped. That is what Vince McMahon likes. So uh, you don't normally see like Kevin o- Kevin Owens and Bray Wyatt. You don't normally see those kind of like dudes getting over the guys with more of like a normal uh, stature and body type. But the Viking uh, Raiders <laughs> is probably like one of the funnest tag teams since like New Day because they're just like these two huge dudes. The one's bald. The one's got like a, way too much hair. And they come out like all dressed in Viking gear, and it's pretty it's pretty amazing. Not to mention like the one a lot of their moves involve the one dude picking up the other dude and throwing him at somebody, which I find hilarious because it's the smaller of the two that picks up the bigger of the two and throws. So that was yeah, really that's incredible. How that works. Yeah, <laughs> it's just. It's like, oh, I could do this. And then you see somebody that's like 250 pounds get like picked up and tossed like they don't weigh 250 pounds. And you're like, oh, I could not do this. Um, but yeah, it was it was really awesome. Saw some of like the people that I watched when I was a kid. Made me feel like a kid again. I paid an absolute ridiculous amount for drinks and food while I was there. That was probably like the most mind-blowing, like beyond airport prices it was crazy how much they charge now, for they, a sandwich did they hook you with the well it's a dollar less if you buy two beers now and you're like that's still 37 dollars. why would i yeah i want two beers i'll get no. the 37 dollar beer combo no there was no uh no like well it's 20 dollars for one or 40 and then you get a cup that you can refill twice for free. There wasn't any of that. There was no um, interesting little like loophole, whatever stuff. But it, yeah, it was just expensive. I think the the popcorn that I got was like seventeen, eighteen dollars for what would have been like a small or medium popcorn at like most movie theaters. That that's painful to hear. And then I think <laughs> it was of bad. what the conversion into Canadian is on that. I'm like, oh, $17 for popcorn is my cell phone bill every month. (laughs) Yeah, that's, and that's like, that's how I I was like, man, this is like a a week's worth of work that I've spent on food. Um, Not quite, but it felt like that for sure. It's your first time going to a live event. You have to factor in a certain amount of those hidden costs. You know, it's never just the ticket price. It's never just the cost of the car. There's all those other things. And yeah, if, if this is the first big event that you're getting to witness live, and especially if you've been a fan for that long, soak it up. Don't even think about it. That money will come back eventually, or uh, it won't matter. Yeah, that's how, exactly how I approached it. I was like, I'm not going to check my like statement balance like the next day because I know I made some bad decisions that night as far as like things that I normally wouldn't have spent money on. I didn't go and get like the uh, the one time Omaha exclusive T shirt or like any of that kind of stuff because I'm sure those were like going for like forty or fifty bucks or whatever at the merch stand. But I definitely, I definitely like soaked in uh, as much as I could, and it was a very, very unique, cool experience. Um, I'd probably definitely do it again. I mean, I, I would definitely do it again if they were in town again and then man uh i will say i think omaha i think nebraskans in general are kind of reserved so i'd like to see a live event a live wwe event or AEW event in a town where they're a little bit more rambunctious because in omaha they're like they're like let me scream omaha and people are like yeah (laughs) it's like (laughs) Like, I, I mean, yes. I get it. You know, we're not very excitable people here, but still, could have tried harder. I just quickly looked up this Viking duo, and they give me huge flashbacks to like Legion of Doom. Oh yeah, and just the one instance every couple of generations. Because you're right, Vince McMahon loves big, beefy dudes. It's so clear and apparent when you look at who gets to actually be a star and have a narrative even for people that don't know anything about wrestling the wrestlers they do know are the guys that vince mcmahon loves and right. you look at these people and like these are the guys who sit in the back of a roadside truck stop bar who are probably <laughs> regulars 
maybe they don't have to leave when the lights go off. These are like sketchy, frightening dudes. <laughs> well, these are like out of a lot of WWE personalities. They're like the dudes that I definitely wouldn't mess with because I'm like the the one bigger guy with like all the hair and stuff. I'm like, man, he's definitely been in some like bar room brawls. Like there's no way he didn't like – I'm not going to say he rode with like Hell's Angels or anything, but like there's zero chance that he was not like a fighter before he entered like WWE. Uh, I would like to know more about him, like where – where they were at, how they got picked up, if they got picked up just as like a tag team, or if like that's how they pitched themselves, or like what, because you usually got to put a lot of time in like smaller circuits before you can even get it like a glimpse at like one of these bigger, uh, like AEW, New Japan, or WWE, like anything like that. So it would be like, I'm sure at some point it'll come out and I can find it probably now if I really tried, but it was a very fun duo. And then seeing Charlotte Flair get dropped by Lita was also very fun. Um, she just looks like a she looks like a Power Rangers villain. Like that's the easiest way I can say she she does not look like a nice person. I'm sure she's lovely in real life, but like entering the ring, she's like actually a very good, um, I'll say like a very good wrestling actress because she sells like the the heel role very well. I was very surprised because like. Unlike you, I don't pay attention to, care about, or yeah, keep on top of anything current day wrestling. I think the last time I cared about watching wrestling was uh, probably the Razor Ramon era. So like, okay, you know, yeah, lots yeah. of hair and toothpicks. Um, <laughs> yeah. Pre Benoit being the worst person, like that sort of everyone's still alive era. Um, but there is something so interesting about watching the the turn of people becoming heels but now seeing them start introducing the uh the the women's side as equal of value to the men's side has been kind of interesting but then yeah like i guess yeah. having a family be with charlotte flair also cool and she does do a really good kind of like mean mug when she comes out um when you were posting about being there I looked up a couple totally legal. I'm in Canada. You can't prove it that it's not streams. And uh, yeah, I, I saw the part where she walks out. First thought in my head was like, oh, this is a, a Tanya Harding act. Okay, great. And then a worse written line. But, you know, they lean into that, calling her a fake throwback Tanya Harding and everything. And she did look like a Power Rangers villain. She looked like a like a weird child, kind of evil, intimidating, overdone, like... It's uh, it's interesting to see where they're allowing these wrestling characters to go, but at the same time, wowie, I do not care at all about <laughs> wrestling. That's what I learned from that five minutes of looking into it. Yeah, it's you either love it or hate it, and I mean, it, at the end of the day, for me, it's like really schlocky, uh, like soap opera storylines. But, like, there's something about that that is just when you, like, fall into, like, the storylines and you actually follow one through, um, you know, sometimes they, they really hit or they really miss. But sometimes there's, just like, a really nice payoff because, you know, unlike in soap operas where you're like, man, I really wish, like, the bad guy just, you know, get beat up. Like, that actually happens in WWE. Like, the bad guy eventually, or good guy, or, like, whoever you don't like, eventually does just get, like, taken out, like, quite handily at some point. And that's, like, one of, like, the best parts about it. That's enough about WWE. Um, yeah, we we'll have to wrap up this Matt cast. Yeah, before before people think that this is only a WWE HeroClix podcast, uh, it is actually just a HeroClix podcast with quite a few WWE tangents. Spoiler alert, uh, Wave 2 might be releasing in February, so that's crazy. We'll see if I that can't actually believe happens. That. I, just, I, I, I don't get it. April 1st and then just leave the date there for retailers. I'll say this. I haven't canceled my, my pre-order yet from over a year ago. I, I still hold that pre-order but at this point i'm not i'm not ho holding out hope that, that it's actually going to be released so we'll see but uh, we will see. <laughs> that's what made us happy 
Uh, now it's time, because this is the first time superfan Luke has been on the show, it's time that uh, we talk a little bit about him and, uh, you know, stuff like, hey, Luke, how did you get into Heroclix and when did you get into Heroclix? Ooh, I've had a on-again, off-again relationship with uh, Heroclix since about 2007, which, uh, if you're a WWE fan, is actually the year that The Undertaker fought Batista for the World Heavyweight Championship. That was the quickest thing that I could Google, and I'm not looking at Google <laughs> further. Um, no, but the first set that I was ever really introduced to was Origins. That had kind of just come out. This is all pre-carded. This is probably before some of the audience that's listening was even old enough to form memories. And I got hooked. I had a friend that brought over these cool little figures. I remember seeing the first two that he ever showed me was the uh, really heavy original Joe Fix-It. And then the Nightcrawler in the Banff Cloud with all the arms and legs coming out. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I was raised through the late 80s and early 90s on hand-me-down stuff. So I see all these comics and I see all these characters that I love being raised on comics and, you know, Spider-Man cartoons and X-Men. And I'm just like, man, I want in. Like, I'm I'm already hooked on board games. I was a real big kind of uh, army builder fan. I had had past experience with Warhammer and uh, Necromunda that I, I really loved. But the cost and the time and the amount of figures, like, it just really turned me off. Fast forward to 2022, and uh, I have more figures, and I spend more money and I waste more time, but I'm not painting anything. So I'm not being productive. And that's really what I wanted to, what I wanted to get out of a hobby. Right. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I still remember the first set that I ever bought into walked up the street to a comic shop that was carrying all the stuff and they had just gotten in their Wednesday shipment. And there was a brick of, uh, uh, of supernova. And so I was like, okay, I want to get into this game. I want to get into supernova. I want to, you know, start playing this thing that looks cool. Looking back, doesn't look as cool. Or at the very least, the figures don't look as good. But the first brick I ever opened had a Colonel America in it. And that euphoric high of cracking a chase figure from what I think was the first chase set and then running back to the comic shop and being like, dude, what is this? And having this old, old guy at the comic shop explain to me what a chase figure is and then offer to buy it off me for what I just paid for the brick, which I did. Thank you very much. Um, it was great. It was the best way to dig lifelong hooks into me. Had a couple instances, like I said, of falling out of it. Uh, one, because the game ended uh, between sale and purchase. And then one, because, you know, life just kind of happens. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to still be playing. I'm really happy to still be able to introduce the game to new people i move quite a bit and this has actually been a great experience for meeting new players at uh, new venues all across the country i've met some really interesting folks that way i've met some really absurdly talented players that way um, you get to really experience the competitive flavor of all the different provinces too which despite the fact that everyone has the ability to go online and net deck like there really are distinct play styles, and I really love seeing people's personality come out and what they team build. So, uh, yeah, Origins was the first set back in 07, and I've been hooked since. Oh, yeah. Yeah, some of those, like, sculpts back then were real bad, but then sculpts like that Nightcrawler, yeah. There was, like, I mean, I can imagine, I didn't play back then, but I can imagine just seeing that figure and being like, yes. That is something I would like to have. Because, um, I mean, well, I see it nowadays, and I'm still like, yeah, that's a really good sculpt. That's a really cool figure. And I know that this is kind of being passed around almost like anecdotally at this point. But I know there was a certain point when they switched over from hand sculpt figures to the you know, 3D models that were then being printed. And some of those figures you go back and look at, there's just levels of, of detail and intricacy to them. Sure, we have a lot of really good stuff now, and I actually think the game looks great now, despite some minor flaws, but that's just any mass-produced good. Um, but there's a, a weird lull, and then it picks back up again. And some of the older stuff I recently found in a crawl space. Um, my, my mom is moving homes, 
And I was going through helping pack up a few things and look at a, a few of my old things to either pull out and donate, get rid of, or bring back home with me. And I found some old figures. And man, the sculpt quality on some of the pre-carded stuff is still good. Paint applications are awful. Eyes are just dots. But uh, as far as the actual shape and the mold itself, like they had some really good high points. And it's been an interesting ebb and flow to kind of watch them come in and out of good and bad sets. You know, for every Wonder Woman, we have a War of the Realms, and that's fine. That's just how the game goes. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I I do think... So I think I was in the game after uh, the hand-sculpted stuff was gone. That's, like, about when I started. But it is interesting. It's still, like, a relic because if you go to HC Realms, you can actually, like, advance search by sculptor, and you can, like, check out, you know. I At one point, I thought about going through the entire list, and there's some, like, some of the sculptors, like, only did a couple pieces, but you can go through and be like, who really knocked it out of the park? Like, which one of these people, like, and where are they now? That's That might be, like, an interesting, like, video I'll do some days like where where did these hero clicks sculptors go did they just move on to other games to sculpt for or like because obviously that was like a talent they had that was making them money at some point so they clearly didn't just disregard that talent and go become like a banker somewhere they probably just moved on to like a different game um well and with the uh with the hand sculpting too I'm not going to say that the people that are doing 3D rendering aren't talented. They are incredibly talented. Looking at something in a digital space and making it a physical thing is a talent that I can't even wrap my head around. These are incredibly talented people. But being able to make it with your hands, it, it's just as impressive, but on a completely different playing field, right? And I go back and I look at stuff like the, uh, the unique House of M Magneto from Armor Wars. It's this old Magneto sitting in a, a giant chair. He's got the cape flowing down. He's got his hand rested on his helmet that's off. And even just coming up with that, thinking of that, I know it was probably based off of a cover or a comic panel, as so many of the, the sculpts are and so many of the best sculpts are. But to be able to make that into a hero clicks figure and have it look as good as it does at the smaller size, back when they were working with significantly worse resources, just because you know that's how technology advances, and have it still look that good? Like, they were such, such artists. Yeah. And if you want to see me cosplay that Magneto, you can check out our Thursday Throwdown videos. It's on one of the thumbnails somewhere. Uh, it might even be on Instagram, the Dial H Instagram. Uh, that is a good sculpt. It was not easy to um, to cosplay. And I don't think I did a great job, but I, I definitely did a job which is what I always shoot for. That's that's what Thursday throwdowns are for, doing a job. Yeah, you got to punch that clock. got to do your time. That's, what, that's oh. how we feel here at Dial H, you know, just the, the daily grind. But uh, speaking of, like, really cool figures like that, like that Magneto, like that Nightcrawler we were just talking about, stuff like that, uh, what are some of your favorite pieces or combos of pieces that you like to use? There's a lot of emotion that I really tie into what I would consider my favorite or favorites. I, I really can't say one favorite, despite the fact that I've recently tried to go through and do a top 10 favorites of old things. They could have all been tied-ish for first, but that Magneto was great. I also really loved the Mystique from the same set. I remember the first time I ever cracked open the Hulkbuster armor. That was a huge one. I've always been really kind of drawn to like the Armor Wars style characters the Wetworks comic and things like that, Brothers in Arms. Uh, but then also like Super C-listers and pre-Avengers being cool, the Avengers and the Cosmic Threats. Um, I think a lot of people, especially if you are a younger listener, player, a lot of people might just assume that all the stuff that's being shown in the MCU films has always been top tier. But the Avengers were never cool pre-2000s. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, it was just the the B-lister book where, unlike X-Men and Spider-Man, which were printing money for them, the Avengers was where characters went to either die or, like, figure themselves out. It was their quirky teen years, right? Um, but well, I used to really... It's also where a lot of, like, writers and artists would kind of, like, cut their teeth before going on to, like, 
you know, you didn't start at Spider-Man. You definitely didn't start at like Fantastic Four or X-Men. Um, but like Avengers, uh, Uncanny Avengers, like all those like weird like spin-off titles, um, Heroes for Hire, like those kind of things. Like, yeah. Um, I mean, back when I can't remember Avengers disassembled or whatever, when, uh, she Hulk tore vision in half or something like that. Um, I feel like that was like a, a huge like turning point where Avengers actually started mattering way more. That was like mid nineties. Uh, but yeah, it actually had like ramifications that were felt in like Spider-Man and, uh, X-Men comics and like further than just like their own little single series yeah and i remember uh because i i've always been a casual comic reader um i think through cultural osmosis and again growing up 80s 90s you just kind of take in a bunch of this stuff but i remember the first time i was ever actually kind of taken by a avenger story was civil war which you know a lot of comic readers will look at as like one of the best marvel arcs um but it was the first time i cared and it was the first time that I cared enough to buy multiple books. And it was the first time I actually wanted to see something through and not just wait and, you know, read a friend's copy or pick up a hardcover a couple months after. Um, but there are a lot of those characters. I mean, yeah, the the Hulkbuster Thor armor is definitely one. But there are a lot of those characters from those books that I remember as a kid that I loved. And when they started showing up in clicks form or when I started learning that they existed, I was sold. Like, there's a old arcade game it, it came to consoles too but captain america and the avengers it's a classic four-player side-scrolling beat-em-up right and there's a vision in the game who's completely white so in supernova there's a vision and he's not completely white but he's got translucent on him so when i saw that i was like okay great translucent and vision i'm i'm in i'm i'm hooked and the same thing you know iron man also in that game the Armor Wars version of Iron Man blasting off the base was fantastic. Uh, there's so many characters from like kind of the Batman villains, Batman's rogues gallery that I used to really love. And when you start going back and looking, and this was all, you know, beginning of game stuff, beginning of my life in the game stuff. But you go back and look at collateral damage and you see the one Clayface holding the safe and holding the beam, the girder in his other hand, and just like all of those figures have such a high spot in my memory. But then you can even jump ahead to more recent stuff. And, well, <laughs> air quotes, recent stuff. Um, when Giant Size X-Men came out and they had all of the uh, tournament prize editions of the main characters, but they were all in their black X-Force costumes, that was that was great. I was reading a very violent X-Men comic, and now here were these very violent X-Men figures. I want to play that. Fast forward to, you know, even present day, Anything that spawns other figures, I'm on board, man. Like, I love gimmicks. I love non-competitive jank. If you can tell me that hitting a multiple man makes another multiple man, I'm going to be entertained by that enough to want to make that work at least once. Oh, yeah. I'll never not enjoy uh, punishing my opponent by having an endless supply of multiple men's. Uh, or Jamie's, oh. or like whatever variation they name it. Um, my newest favorite is the the super rare Ultron from Empire. When you hit him, his trait to make so it's either a free if there are no Ultron drones or a power action if there is Ultron drones. But regardless of free or power, if he's been damaged since your last turn, he gets to make two instead. And just punishing my opponent by like, oh yeah, you hit him a couple times, great. Now here's two for free, and then I'm going to power action to make two more. Suddenly there's four Ultron drones, and like, man, that's just a lot of fun. I really, like, my my bread and butter in this game has always been bystander generation uh, since I very first began. It's just one of my favorite mechanics. If I can do it for free, and if I can do it with no cap on like how many I can generate... It's just, it's awesome. So I think we kind of already have an, a clue to this, but are you typically more of a meta player or a casual player? I mean, no doubt casual. I think much like everyone else, I enjoy a certain degree of meta. I really enjoy being able to support my venues by going out past tense, I guess, not in the last two years, um, but going out and supporting the community, 
seeing the people that you enjoy that play the game, and then supporting the venues by you know playing in competitive tournaments. But I've been knocked out first round in competitive tournaments before, and I've had a great time. There was definitely a point, probably back in about 2010, where I was getting significantly more competitive. Uh, and probably the high peak was right around when the White Lantern chases started coming out. The idea of being able to have like White Lantern flash and things like that, just it, it did something for me where it inspired me to build and play more competitive. But I didn't like where that was taking me. I didn't like that there was a huge collection I had that I wasn't looking at. I didn't like that I was starting to kind of ruin the fun at home games that I was having with friends. And uh, I think that ultimately that dipping the toe into competitive was really good because now I value casual play more. I value those fun teams more. I used to love low point X-Men swarm teams. And this is all like pre-carded era stuff, right? Just running out as many, you know, 20, 30 point X-Men as you can. Now that turns into, much like you said with the Ultron drones, uh, pog generators or figure generators, things like that. If I only wanted to play meta, sure, there's an element of that that you could still have. I mean, Emperor Gladiator pops out pieces. We know that that is a figure that sees a lot of meta play. But I wouldn't be sidelining, you know, the same amount of Sentinels. I wouldn't be having the same amount of fun. Uh, I wouldn't be trying something like Brood Queen. Uh, I'm not playing Brood Queen, but I certainly wouldn't if I was only concerned with meta. No, I think casual's really fun. And uh, I think having your thumb on the pulse of meta, or at the very least, having it on the pulse of what an online community tells you the meta is, is important if you want to start playing in certain communities, because no one wants to go out to a tournament and just get wiped like that for most people is not a fun experience. Um, but it's just not interesting or compelling enough. And I'd rather really have fun. I'd rather, you know, field the majority of the figures I have. Yeah. Then I I agree. I mean, obviously, um, anyone who's listened to this podcast before knows that we tend to lean quite a bit more towards the casual. And for me, it's because of, like, a lot of those same reasons. I've had my moments where I've gone pretty much as far to the competitive as I'm willing to go. I'm just not willing to sink that much time and effort and like emotional energy into a team. Um, and then end up with like almost no enjoyment because when I, when I build as good of a team as I can and I can like stomp people with it and win tournaments and stuff at the end of the day, I don't feel that great. It's like, you know, even when I, I won States in like 2018 with like a Hawkeye Avengers build and you know, that was probably like a high point of my hero clicks career as far as like actual play goes, because I honestly did not care for like the, the way the team played. I was like, man, like this, this game is, in my opinion, not really built or regulated in a way that makes competitive, like great. Um, and I'm not saying that if you play competitively in this game that like, you know, it's not good or anything like that, because obviously you can get enjoyment out of that. But I just feel like too much of it is min-maxing, playing like the the smallest denominator characters that give you the best impact. And a lot of like teams, like how many teams are probably running multiple man now just because you can throw up so much barrier that it takes your opponent like completely out of the equation. And uh, I just, I hate barrier tech. I hate not actually playing the game until it's like too late kind of thing. Um, the first 30 minutes of your hero clicks game should not be you barriering and waiting for your opponent to like get close enough where you can attack them. That's, that's just not fun for me. I don't understand how it's fun for other people, so I can't even pretend like I know, but if that's how you get enjoyment, then like, you know, there's a niche for that as well. And uh, I mean, obviously that's the more, uh, I would say like prolific online, um, people that you'll see are more of like the competitive people, the people that will actually go and seek out podcasts and videos and stuff tend to like air more towards the competitive. But, uh, you know, I still think casual brings way more enjoyable like content to the game. Cause like you said, with brood queen, there's somebody at my local venue that I've, I've played against brood queen three times now. And part of me is like, man, if you don't prepare for brood queen in a casual setting, 
it's actually really frustrating because she spits out those those stupid little broods at like a ridiculous pace. It's, you know, hit a leadership, there's one. Power action, there's another. And then suddenly you've got two figures with like toughness and I think they're four clicks deep or something like that. And you have to like chew through those to get through her to her. Um, but yeah, there, I mean... I think casual allows for things like that to thrive way more better. And, you know, people constantly tout how like the competitive scene has like more, more possibilities and more uh, meta options now more than like ever, but casually it's everything like everything except the 1%. So it's, you know, 99% of the field is available casually. Uh, including like all the golden age stuff, because that still rocks to play. Uh, but not okay. To get you too... need to go ahead. Sorry, you need to get everyone in your venue to pull together two dollars and buy that brood queen player another booster. Um, <laughs> I know that this is probably going to be an unpopular opinion, but at the same time, Wiz Kids, if you're listening, and we know that you are, we've seen the analytics. We have not seen the analytics. I certainly have not seen the analytics. That stuff doesn't make it up here. But um, I I would love if Worlds went exclusively online. Because I think about what I really used to love and what got me into the game. And it was, you know, sitting down across from someone. It was seeing the figures. And I think, especially after the last two years, everyone would agree there is a difference between online play, even the best online play, even, you know, your tabletop simulators where you can see the figure and rotate around. There's a difference between that and physically in front of you. And we're not talking about a dice algorithm. We're just talking about the figures and the board and the experience and the weird conversations and the almost losing your mind when your best friend knocks over his coffee and it gets close to the map and it's the only copy of the map you have. And you don't want to get mad at your friend, but do you put your sweater in line of the coffee and ruin your sweater? It's a white sweater. Are you good? So you make those sorts of snap decisions that online you just don't have to. But I think that it's fair to say there's a lot of meta players who probably got into this because they like things. They probably didn't look at it and just say, that's an easy game to be good at, and I want to be the person who's known for being good at it. Let me join this game. That's unrealistic, right? I doubt so, anyone started playing Hero Clicks by saying, like, the mechanics of this game are just so tight and great that I want to, like, I want to be the best at this game because of these awesome mechanics. I don't think there's the a company, single Clicks player uh, that like started with that. No. The company seems to have a great hold on the competitive scene. Let me join this game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it would be super interesting if, because competitive does not rely on, I think, a lot of the joy of what casual players like about the physical game, take Worlds, put it online. Do it over the course of a week or two. Have a good tournament bracket system structured in there somehow. I'm not smart enough or paid enough to come up with how this is going to work. WizKids, that's on you. But then it can actually be a true Worlds. Then it can be a, you know, global, because I think especially, well, North America, um, but we get very tunnel visioned on who plays the game. And there's other continents that get this product, right? Like oh, we, yeah. we know like, that, right? In Remember that? <laughs> we had a team from Italy, um, I think we had a team from the UK and by like not disparaging them by saying like a team, but like it was a huge cost for me. It was like a couple hundred bucks for a plane ticket and then a couple hundred bucks for a hotel room and then access to the venue. Um, for them, it was way more because like, you know, obviously they had to travel from overseas they had to have like visas in order they had to and they managed to like scrounge together enough people that were interested and competitive enough to travel all the way to philadelphia to do that and like i don't think anyone from it italy should ever want to go to philadelphia for any reason but you know those like six or seven people that came like they had a good time and yeah i i do agree i think the online aspect actually allows like we here at dial H like we've got metrics, whether they're real or not, we've got people um, all over South America, all over Europe, uh, quite a few Australia players. 
which obviously, you know, Australia also gets product that's probably second to like the UK, well, not the UK, but um, other parts of the EU, because I guess UK is not necessarily part of the EU anymore. But, you know, there's like US, Canada, and then the UK, and then there's the EU and Australia that are like vying for fourth. And I think that there's whole different metas in those regions because i've seen like the teams that have won nationals down in like uh south american regions and those teams are things that i look at and i'm like how does that work because comparatively that's not something i see a whole lot up here and i think it comes down a little bit to like how much product they get but then also just you know if your local scene doesn't play a whole lot of xyz then like how does that match up when you know you play online and uh you run against like some american teams that run xyz or whatever so i do yeah agree that that would be a great shift uh if worlds of course i want worlds to be a physical thing because i just enjoy going to it um but technology the way it is nowadays i don't think it would be too hard to ask for you know we could do an online worlds and an in-person worlds and also like some sort of combination of the two, which I think would be probably logistically hard, but I think it'd be pretty doable. I don't think it'd be too much to ask having like a row of computers, you load your team up or you have a judge load your team up and you play against somebody wherever. And you know, like if, if it's like that kind of play, I think that'd be great. I'm just imagining those giant computers that used to play chess against people that were like the size of the 2001 obelisk, just sitting across from pick your favorite online hero clicks personality. <laughs> and they're just sitting at a table, <laughs> a, a, a giant black void that every so often is like, uh, yes, champion to a one. And they're like, damn it. <laughs> no, I, I think uh, that the only way to win too. is to not play the game. That's the famous war games. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I do um, think it's in with the South American players because you're right. Like you see build sheets from other countries, and you're just like, wow, that that one that placed. And I think there's a big difference between your meta and the meta. And when people start thinking that they are the entirety of who plays the game, they think that theirs is actually capital the, and that's just not accurate. And I'd love to see more representation from other players and I'd love to see more involvement and I'd love to see more kind of consideration for, and um, that doesn't mean just, you know, shipping them a, a map to buy and hand out to their winners every so often. That means whiz kids stepping up. And if we didn't have the ability to have an in-person worlds, but then what they did instead was really leaned into a nationals or say convention exclusives are now available at more things like Gen Con, and if they start doing more in-person stuff like that, I could make up for it. And that could potentially provide just as good of an experience for people. Yeah, absolutely. Honestly, I think something's going to have to give. Um, I'm sure WizKids is working on it. (coughs) I'm sure they're working on it. Um, If they're listening, hopefully they're working on it. But something's definitely got to give because, you know, in-person play is great. Uh, online play is eh, at best it's accessible you know at worst it's let's just say like it's easy to make roll 20 roll things the way you want to it's easy to like manipulate stuff on the player's end Um, and I don't want to say that like anyone who's won something on roll 20 like they should have like you know an asterisk next to their name or anything like that but i will say that you know looking into it it's not the hardest thing to like either have like a coach in your ear or like something like that so if there was actually you know back in the day a hero clicks online and i think that whiz kids could really swing it like i think they have the money they i think they have the resources to swing it i think they should definitely try in the next couple of years to get something like rolled out because it's like the prime time to actually, I mean, really the prime time would have been to have that released in like 2019 or uh, early yeah, 2020. That would, like- that would have been like the best, but 
Um, let's just be honest. Like they're, they're losing players every day that like, there isn't a real hero clicks, like fix solution online kind of thing. Yeah. That being said, um, even just like the Pacific Northwest has completely different build styles to, you know, the like central United States or like the lower South, uh, south of like the mason dixon line kind of united states so it's interesting just to like see like that regional demographic and like what wins up in like oregon compared to uh like louisiana or wherever um but yeah i i think that's like a pretty good idea of like what uh hero clicks around the world could do if it was like truly a world hero clicks you know stop making it like mr universe where there is only one planet involved in the universe uh make it like instead of hero clicks worlds where it's u.s and adjacent countries it could be hero clicks worlds the world and that'd be pretty cool um i don't know anything about blockchain but maybe you can use that to make a dice rolling algorithm that people don't question or hack uh huh Figure it out, anything, with kids. anything where it's like server specific that's rolling the dice instead of on the user end is probably best. But yeah, we should stop talking about that. <laughs> uh, so speaking of worlds and all those kind of things, uh, what's your favorite format to play? If it's like, you know, if it's your birthday and your local judge is like, you get to pick the format this week. What are we playing? What's going on? Uh, spooky coincidence. My local judge, who I've not seen in two years, uh, just messaged me to ask about the Fantastic Four storyline kit. So, Mike, I'll give you after this. You're welcome. Yeah, because I cracked three, and all three of them were the exact same Invisible Woman. Super cool. Uh, but no, if if it's up to me, if I get to choose dinner and dessert, man, we're, we're playing Sealed. Um, I don't think there is a better joy than being forced to play with 10 random figures and just going with it. Like all of the concern, all of the anxiety, all of the stress of doing well, when you're playing sealed and there's not prizing on the line, if you're just playing sealed, it's one of the most fun times you can have. And you will put teams together. You will put figures on your build that normally you would never even consider because you know what? If it's, the difference between 35 points under build or putting on uh, Carmilla Uniscone or whatever sure. generic. Yeah, right? Like, you'll fill those points. And if that's what you got, that's what you got. And I, I really love those experiences. And you end up with funny things. You end up with throwing your arms up moments. You end up with some of, like, the strongest fist pump victories. Um, I don't think there's anything better out there for my enjoyment of the game than 300 sealed. Now, that said, pretty far second place, 300 Modern. It's not even for necessarily the competitive part of it, but that's what the game's meant to be played at. Whether or not WizKids encourages other formats or not, or point values or not, we all know that the game is no, meant to be built for 300. Yeah. It's pretty obvious when when most players cap, or sorry, most figures cap at 300, um, the game is quite handily in like the 300 zone i honestly yeah. think you could at this point almost make an argument for being like 200 to 250 being like an optional build like size because there is so many really solid 50 point pieces that any team that's you know m like less than six figures it's like oh wow like what big heavy hitter did they sneak onto the team because i mean other than you know like your 75 point like dooms or something like that you almost never have to reach for like a hundred point figure um emperor gladiator immortal hulk there's like a few but man most of the time it's those like 50 point figures and it's just like, yeah, when you're locked into three actions, WizKids obviously wants you to play like those 50, 60 lower point kind of like figures. They want you to have a, a ton of little support pieces and then a couple big hitters. Well, and if you're playing casual too, you're not going to be able to utilize all your actions. You're splitting up your teams. It doesn't feel good to be like, oh, well, I had to leave these characters out of it. I'm playing essentially two different teams in two different waves. 
there's a yeah there, there's something really apparent about the 300 point build uh just in how they design figures and yeah if if you ever want to if you ever want to like really experience uh hero clicks in a unique way try play a 200 point game with a friend try play a 400 point look at how dramatically different they both go but uh sometimes yeah sometimes those teams aren't as different as you think they are and especially in the world of setting aside a minimum 35 25 points for objects and for maps like teams are pretty similar at two versus three yeah I'd have to agree. Um, my latest team built, like my latest uh, match that I did was 400, and then you got to add on any vehicle at 100 points or less for free. So it was essentially a 500-point build for most of the teams. I At one point, I was playing a three-way battle, and I was able to split my team into two and steal, still feel like I had two very strong offensive like teams and it was like roughly 250 and 250 that like I had split. So I think that's pretty on the nose. So uh, you went Tony Stark's car, of course, right? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I went with, so I modded the invisible jet, that like really terrible uh, vehicle that honestly isn't that great at all. Um, oh, the, the I modded it jet. to have an X-Wing uh, model of the Millennium Falcon on top and I was like I've never been able to play this it's been on my shelf for a long time but I really want to play the Millennium Falcon so yeah I, I did a Amazon's team I uh, didn't have a Wonder Woman that I really wanted to pilot it so it didn't get the the real cool like can't be targeted away from like six squares or more whatever power it has but uh, I did play the title Wonder Woman and at one point, I got her to her minus five, which turns her to a special click, and then she can't be damaged like at all while she's on that click. And you only lose the game if there's no other friendly characters with the Amazon keyword. So at 400 points, it's really hard to KO, especially out of the Wonder Woman set. It's really hard to KO uh, roughly 330 points of Amazons because or Amazon keyword characters because uh most of them have the Wonder Woman team ability with super sense somewhere on their dial like even Ferdinand if you don't hit him all the way through his dial he ends up with a super sense Wonder Woman TA so everyone's like a 50-50 and then I've got this crazy title character that's running around with a 12 for 4 charge and uh penetrating damage so it's pretty it's pretty daunting <laughs> once she hits that click. I think my opponent was like, ah, I really should have looked at what she does because that is more of a threat than anything else now. Um but yes, how you feel. Getting Your back on cards. topic. I, I also really love sealed. Um I think three hundred sealed really stretches your imagination. Uh before XDPS, I never would have like playing X D X T P S sealed x-men dark phoenix saga i never would have put scanner on the board to this day i have never put scanner on the board in sealed scanner was on most of my teams because it's a cheap prob piece it spits out a bystander that doesn't score any points for your opponent if they ko it um what a terrible figure outside of sealed but in sealed like yeah that's something where like you have to you have to make those weird little decisions do i play vange whedon at that you know what is it 75 point line and choose to go to click 25 uh, nowadays it's not as big of a jump to do that but back then if you got in capped you just died and so saw a lot of that saw a lot of like kind of funky stuff happening a lot of like weird choices that people make when it comes to sealed uh speaking of your judge and stuff like that what is your usual venue if and when do you have a usual venue i guess i am lucky enough to have played all across the country and uh had quite a few regular venues but currently uh here in winnipeg my regular venue sadly hasn't been open for the last uh nearly two years now 
Um, we actually haven't seen a return to in-person play in stores, but uh, is a shop called Game Night. It's a great little space with a lot of very fantastic staff uh, in South Osborne. Game Night is really one of probably the, I, I, I want to say more diverse shops that we have as far as the stuff that they carry. Um, you know, of course, they have your staple support your business magic card uh, counter in the back. But, you know, if you want casual stuff for a family that doesn't play board games, it's there. If you want cards and puzzles, it's there. If you want every miniature under the sun, it's there. Game night has been great. It's been a really fun place to play. Um, I don't know how long our judge Mike has actually been judging, but the entire time that I've been playing there, Mike has been running the show. And yeah, we, we see people come in from out of town, out of province. Um, you know, it's a great space to be able to support a lot of people when it is safe enough to support a lot of people. Yeah, game night's been great. Um, prior to this, though, I was in Toronto for a while, and my venue in Toronto was uh, 401 Games, one of the 401 Games. Um, if you've ever listened to any other Canadian Heroclix content online, you have undoubtedly heard many of the people that frequented 401. I don't mean to pit venues against each other or players against each other, but there is just no one nicer to play against than some of the 401 folks. Uh, but at the same time, some of the biggest and most aggressive beatings I've ever taken in Heroclix have come from 401 folks. But that's also why I really valued uh, that 401 used to do two games a week. One was a fun week, or a fun game per week, and then one was a competitive meta week game. So uh, great spaces. Um, you know, hopefully 401 is doing okay in Toronto during lockdown with uh, with limited in stores even being open and play. But uh, yeah, game game night here in Winnipeg. Game night games. You can't miss it. It's got a Giant stupid dragon painted on the outside. It's an embarrassment to walk into as an adult. Don't they always have a giant dragon painted on the outside? Uh, no, nothing like carrying my my little tackle box full of miniatures across a parking lot to a venue that has like a giant dragon or at one point a giant troll painted on like the outside. And I was like, yes, this is what I choose to do. Uh, you to walk in with someone else and be like, I, I actually work for them. Um, I'm kind of an assistant. I'm just here with them. It's, it's not a thing. It's not for me. <laughs> right. No, I need to like start carrying my clicks in a briefcase so I can be like, I'm just here to serve some guy papers. That's I'm, I'm here to serve paperwork for legal things, big legal They're things. They're being audited again. <laughs> yeah. Then I get to crack open my briefcase like uh, Pulp Fiction, and it glows. Except instead of uh, Marcellus Wallace's soul, it's Heroclix figures. Uh, so, it's unreleased Con Ellie. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of speaking of uh, the best figure that we could ever possibly get, or best object in Heroclix we could ever possibly get. Uh, if you were to win worlds, or you know you want a sweepstakes or whatever the case may be, what figure would you choose to make? If you could so make when anything I place, under the sun. Yeah, when I place first at supermarket sweeps and default on my sweet novelty check to make a figure for a game no one's heard of, um, I don't know why people... I, I mean, I guess everyone has their own personal preference. Everyone makes a figure they're attached to. When people say that their favorite comic book character is the this isn't intended to be uh, a shot just the first one that came to mind was black adam uh, but if you say that's your favorite figure i believe you that's your favorite figure and i'm stoked that people can do that i wish we had more obscure people making figures but uh no the the first comic that i ever purchased with my own money like my own little kid went and mowed lawns money uh it was silver surfer 69 and on the cover is this and this isn't a good comic it's not a comic from a run that anyone cares about but it's from that era of comics where the front cover was just meant to sell the comic and then the inside was just trash um but there's a figure a figure sorry a character called Cahoon. it's k-h-o-o-n possibly coon maybe Cahoon. 
I feel more comfortable saying Cahoon. We'll go with that. It's my figure. Um, no, I would absolutely make this character Cahoon. He, in one book, because he only ever appears for one book, um, and then he's very, very dead by the end, he goes up against Silver Surfer. He's this, you know, alien figure that kind of looks like kind of looks like the worst 90s character design. He's got like a mech suit that is made out of his space uh, his spacecraft that crashed. So he makes himself this mech suit to survive. It becomes like a power suit. His face looks like a weird skull evil tooth monster thing. Very 90s. Um, but he uses the parts of his ship to build this power suit and then to also build these war dogs that are like these giant robotic monster wolves, right? And I think about the idea of a character who can generate pogs, which we've already established, something I love, uh, someone who's very much a D-rate character at best, someone who's gone up against one of my favorite characters, Silver Surfer, sadly, um, someone who's cosmic, someone who wears a cool-looking robot armor, again, hits all the weak points for me, and then generates these neat pogs like that's great but then on top of that and i think that i wouldn't have ever thought of this if we didn't just receive that sue storm uh, that i'm about to give a duplicate to mike of uh, because that cosmic sue when she dies she gives someone else powers and if you've ever read the one comic that cahoon is in in the end he dies he goes up against galactus he's in galactus's ship he gets kind of cocky and galactus goes no, no, you're not going to live. I'm going to absorb you into my ship. And he just has all these tentacles and weird outlets just plug into Cahoon and they absorb him into the ship. And the final panels of the book are him screaming as he slowly becomes part of the ship. And I really like the idea of him dying and then being able to provide maybe a character with the cosmic keyword stats or maybe then becoming an equip or maybe he dies and his ship armor like something with that right uh and yeah i would absolutely make this bogus character from 96 no sorry from uh 92 that no one has ever heard of hmm i've definitely never heard of this character you make it sound quite quite a bit more interesting than uh the fact that he's only in like a small series but um one book he shows up and then is gone his entire backstory he's from an alien race that they never mention again jeez he was able to go toe to toe with the silver surfer and then uh was only bested by galactus because of his own hubris hmm. i mean ability to go toe to toe with anyone is uh, a big shrug emoji but to sell <laughs> one book to me a little kid it worked Sure. We do have the rest of the show to get to, so we're going to go ahead and just jump right into the news. All right. The news this week is pretty simple. Uh, Scott Porter did that thing where he takes a brick and he unboxes it, and everyone oohs and ahs and... uh, makes funny faces and Scott tells us all the histories of the comic that it's based on and about the characters that he pulls. So it was really fun. I'm not going to lie. It was a fun unboxing. I watched some of it. I did not manage to watch all five episodes. Luckily I don't have to because most of the figures were pretty bland. So I'm just going to go over some quick highlights. We have shifting focus Thor's in this set. Uh, We have, um, shifting focus visions and then before we get into what some of like the picks that we like from the set are the fast forces is probably one of my favorite fast forces that we've seen and I don't say that because it's like anything impressive but as we were talking earlier about like how this game is very much cultured to a 300 point modern kind of aspect we have a 25 point black widow that's a team player uh four range, two lightning bolts with stealth and empower. And that's all she really does. But with the Avengers, martial artist, shield, spy, she can copy team abilities. She can use empower. She's got decent stats 
for 25 points, it's pretty interesting. And then likewise, a 25-point stealth outwit Black Panther with Avengers, Ruler, Wakanda, and Warrior. It's just like, if you're an Avengers team and you need, or a Ruler team or whatever, and you just need a simple outwit, it's 25 points. It's pretty nuts. Uh, Along the same vein... We've got a 25-point Loki in this Fast Forces. All of these are switch clicks, so they have multiple uh, point values. But I'm only talking about the really cheap ones, because those are the ones that I think people would be most interested in. 25-point uh, Loki has the Mystic's team ability with Prob, and he's an 11 for 3. Um, he's got phasing top dial, no defense power, but you know you just need... Phasing and prob with six range. He's got Asgardian, Deity, and Mystical keywords for 25 points. It's pretty nuts. Uh, An Enchantress who has TK and Outwit with Mystic's team ability for 25 points. That's all she's really got, but I mean, again. And then an Executioner who... I'm not going to say... So all Executioner has for 25 points is Blades and Toughness top dial. He does get it in Vulnerability and Exploit after that, but... The main reason I'm going to put this Executioner on teams is so I can wildcard the Masters of Evil team ability, which is now like PD or Hydra except for close attacks. And I did check this is the cheapest Masters of Evil in at least modern uh, outside of the Ultron drones bystanders. Um but this is the cheapest Masters of Evil in modern, probably the cheapest of Masters of Evil team ability just period, but I don't know for sure. But 25 points seems like that's probably true. And it's, I don't know, it's just a good Fast Forces, to be honest. It's a like the sculpts could be better. Um, the higher dials could be a little bit more interesting. A lot of the times they're overshadowed by the cheaper dials. Um, the Thor is all but useless in my opinion compared to the rest of the figures. That's the only one I didn't mention. Uh, but yeah, there's so many of these cheap 25 point figures that you could easily make a, let's see, 125 point team and still have plenty of room for something else. Uh, but moving on to the actual set, uh, not for nothing. Oh, go ahead. If, uh, if people are not necessarily as enchanted with a uh, recruiter as I think a lot of us are or are not. Hey, here's a 25 point sideline figure that you don't have to bring in, but that if you choose to, it doesn't give up as many points as a lot of the other figures. Oh do. yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah if, I mean, it's similar to um, like super friends or like the, whatever calling somebody in that could potentially get your opponent more points. Um, if you really need to boost some close attack damage, like let's say you've got Doom and he's trying to make a triple attack and you recruit her in Black Widow who's got Empower or you know, you've know you just been missing everything and you've spent all of your theme team probs, you pull in Loki or it's like late game and you really need an outwit, you pull in Enchantress. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, I think there's a ton of options that Black Leopard or not Black Leopard, Black Panther um, with just simple stealth outwit. You know, he's got charge, or not charge, he's got blades and super senses mid-dial, but really, you're just paying 25 points for this top line, and it's just stealth outwit, and that's still a really solid combo for 25 points. Um, yep. I can't remember how much he costed in ADW. There was, I think it was 30 points for the exact same stealth outwit combo. Now, I mean, granted, that was a shifting focus version, which is probably a little bit better than this one. But, I mean, for an Avenger or Wakanda or Ruler team, it's just a really solid investment. It's also great seeing WizKids take something that I think worked really well with the miniatures games, the switch clicks mechanics and the, you know, air quotes, advanced dial and then the less expensive, uh, you know, easier intro dial. Taking that and moving it over to a Fast Forces is fantastic. Like, they definitely deserve a little bit of applause for that. They're giving people that want to buy Fast Forces double the value. And they're also not forcing you to uh, have to buy a product that's three times more expensive in the miniatures game just to get that. I understand that 
you know, hard map tiles and a PAC probably justify the extra $30 or whatever it is. But uh, I think this is a cool way to kick back off Fast Forces. Yeah, I think it's... And I mean, if I'm a new casual player, I'm playing that Thor at 75, uh, the Black Widow at 50, the Black Panther at 50. I'm playing like those other bigger dials because those give you more utility. Uh, if I'm a min-max like competitive player though or even just somebody who like is more used to a normal 300 setting i'm definitely looking at these cheaper dials and being like i can make this work on this team like i don't know if mystical had a tk outwit for 25 points Uh, i'm guessing as guardian keyword definitely didn't but like you know now it does if you want to play enchantress at 25 uh, same with like Executioner. If you're playing a Masters of Evil team or a Warrior or Asgardian team and you've got a bunch of people, I mean, even if you don't have a bunch of people to copy the team ability, um, he's a minus one to stats every time he's adjacent to somebody, to an opposing character and a friendly character making a close attack. So that's a really solid figure, like for 25 points. I pay 25 points for essentially a like globe or global perplex kind of thing like that where it applies to any figure that's next to him and the opposing character i really like that uh and then yeah like you said i mean it's just a it's a really good way to kick off the fast forces i do wish the sculpts were a little bit more dynamic but again oh we can talk about that let's (laughs) uh let's talk about what our good friend and uh champion of the game scott porter opened up in his boxes so, I mean, what's in, uh, what's in Scott's boxes? <laughs> well, what's in Scott's boxes? He, he opened a lot of stuff. Um, the first thing hands off to go the guy. in order of like things that like catch my eye. So the first thing is number four in the set that I'm going to talk about. And this is Scarlet, Witch coming in at 30 points. She's got a single special power that is what I must do, I can't do on my own. And it's phasing teleport, passenger three, but only to carry characters that share a keyword with her. Those keywords being Avengers, Latveria, Mystical, Young Avengers. Latveria and Avengers, both decent uh, keywords. Mystical, pretty solid option. Young Avengers, I don't think any teams are really being built around that, at least. Not no, it was a keyword. Yet. No. Uh, so. She's got phasing teleport passenger three Avengers team ability. So she's moving 11 speed while carrying three people. And then on top of that, she's got a probability control for her entire dial. It's only four clicks long. She's only four range. She does have TK, but essentially one of the better taxis for the point value. This is like, you know, um, what was uh Voyager from ABPI. This is like the better version of that. She doesn't go quite as far she doesn't have power cosmic or like some things like that but she's quite a bit cheaper and she's got prob on dial i think she'll see play like i just i have to imagine that passenger three is still really good when you've got prob attached what a great way to immediately devalue your um your empire set number 43 rare scarlet witch who was 10 10 tk 18 ESD, and then three damage with that special outwit prob, but wasn't a flyer and 50 points. Yeah, for 20 points less, you get so much more. And this is just a common, so it's. It's almost such a great value. I'm surprised that I'm not getting half off at Applebee's. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It's almost like you didn't have to pay $10 for parking to get the Scarlet Witch. You only had to pay $15 for a booster. And she's probably one of your commons. Um, no, this is going to be a like awesome instant play and in sealed, and then pretty easy to build around. It's what it lacks in like flavor. Like, and it, believe me, it lacks a lot in flavor. Um, it makes up for in just like sheer utility because it's it's pretty solid when it comes to that. And I think we're going to be in a drought for Scarlet Witch figures coming up right away. So it's nice to see them giving us another one so soon. <laughs> yeah. The d- the next set I'm I've been assured by WizKids the next set will not have a single Scarlet Witch so this might be the last one we see for quite a while. It's uh it's it's overdue. I've been saying for years no more mutants and uh, despite the fact that Wanda is or isn't depending on the run 
uh, yeah, get her, get her out. Give me more room for underrepresented figures like, uh, you know, the Visions and Captain Americas of of uh, Hero Clicks. Oh, absolutely. Characters that we haven't seen in quite a while. Uh, another character <laughs> that I really want to mention that we haven't seen since, oh, I don't know, uh, Empire. And we also saw in like heavy un or heavy common fashion. No, he wasn't uncommon in Empire, wasn't he? Um, anyhow, it's number 007 in the set. Loki who has a very Dr. Fate from JLU-esque trait where uh, he's got a single trait, no attack power. Uh, during force construction, you may add a 007 Loki at 10 points if you also have a 007 Loki starting at, a f at 50 points on your starting force. For all characters with this trait, if there are two to four Lokis on your force of this specific collector's number, you get a plus one to your action total. If there are five or more 007 Lokis on your force, you get plus two to your action total. So pretty much a copy-paste trait as Dr. Fate. Uh, his dial is quite a bit different. Um, he has flight, uh, stealth, super senses, and prob top dial, or on the single-click 10-point line. He has Mystic's team ability, which Dr. Fate also had. He's got Asgardian, de de Deity, and Mystical Keywords. Uh, and then his mid-dial is sidestep with outwit and energy shield deflection. His uh, attack values and damage values actually like surprisingly okay. So he's 10 for threes on the two starting clicks. And then his mid-dial range is 11 for two. And then he's got 8-speed uh, sidestep and 17 defense with energy shield. So he's not really going to stick around for a lot but he is going to punish your opponent for every 10 points they take from you and in the meantime getting that plus two action total is pretty sweet it's a slightly more economical version than the JLU fates but at the same time you can run both sets of five or more Lokis and five or more fates for not that much it's pretty interesting I never want to sit down across from that. That's already a terrible idea. Just, I have seven actions for my team. Uh, oh, wait, I have a leadership. I have eight actions for my team. Yeah, that's not really... I mean, at a certain point, it's going to give you less return than it's worth. But, man, is it just, like, hilarious that that can be a possibility? Where it's like... Remember the one set where we thought that Autonomous was going to run wild? And then they just abandoned it almost entirely. Oh, yeah. And I mean, Spider-Man Venom Absolute Carnage. It was like, I mean, we had full figures that had it. It wasn't just bystanders. It wasn't, there's was actual figures like Mary Jane, Marvella, all of the alter egos for the most part had it. And then, yeah, we just have not seen it since then. So strange. I think, I mean, that must have been, like, so that was in 2020. It must have been, like, pre-rules. And once, like, the new rules rolled out, they were like, mm, maybe there's something bad about having autonomous characters that don't push when they take a second action token. Because I think yeah. if anything from that, that, they learned that maybe characters that reduce or add on free actions, maybe both are bad ideas. Maybe that's 1,776 bad ideas. Yeah, 1,007. A very specific number for a very specific trait. My favorite uh, number. It's the Silver Surfer book I bought. 1,776? I didn't know they made nah, any just... issues yet. Is there any figure that uh, Scott unboxed that really stood out to you in this set? Or like was at least interesting? <sighs> so... A joke that maybe only I enjoy, that if you're a patron on the Discord, you might have seen as well and not laughed at. It's hard to get excited about figures that look like generic people going to work waiting for the bus. If they don't have good dials or good sculpts, ooh, it's, uh, it's tough, man. It's tough. But there were a couple figures, and there were a couple really interesting figures. Uh, I think that Figure number 15, Lady Sif. Despite the fact that she's 55 points, she is six clicks long. She starts with an eight charge, boot symbol, two target, 11 attack with blades, 18, 
and a three with, uh, sorry, 18 in Vulm with a three damage and leadership. As Guardian Avengers Deity Warrior, rally one on friendly for attack rolls, uh, where if she removes the dice, she gets to make a free attack, free close attack. And then she just has, as a part of the rally as well, traded flurry. So 55 is kind of weird, uh, but I also enjoy the fact that her real name, Sif, is shorter than her clicks name of Lady <laughs> Yeah, Lady because Sif that's is her dumb. title. Yeah. Her real name is and no, like the uh, the Human Torch chase that we saw, 058, Fantastic 14, Billy, and Mystics. And, you know, you can go and look at his dial. He's an 11, 12, 18, 4, 7 range, dual target. Uh, but he has the movement ability to destroy blocking when he moves through it. He can target destroy blocking. And then on top of that, he has, as a part of his trait, the Eternal Flame of Destruction. Human Torch deals penetrating damage. Cool, fine. He's got a 4 damage. He's got prob, deals pen. Great, we like to see it. But hard stop, second part of that trait, free. Choose a debris marker within range. Opposing characters occupying or adjacent to the marker are dealt one damage. It's probably rare that you're going to have an opposing character occupying a debris marker. But if I can shoot through and destroy on movement and make a debris marker, that's probably going to come up. Now, it's only one damage. It's not one penetrating. It's not one unavoidable. But man, oh man, there's a lot of figures that don't have reducers these days. And if you are burying up your figures and I'm shooting through one of those barrier markers, guess what? You're adjacent to it. So let's do that. And then on top of that, he has poison, but not even just normal poison. He can activate his poison after a move. I think that's cool. Now, it's 100 points, and that means that he is not high level meta play competitive, but he also looks dope. So I'm yeah. on board with this weird chalice of human makes torch wanna, fire. His sculpt makes me want to scream like, Harry, did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? Or whatever it is that Dumbledore screams. Um. I don't know who that is. I've never uh, played that set or game or whatever <laughs> you're talking about. Um, he just looks like he's coming out of like a very weird chalice. That is. He reminds the, me of the uh, early 2000s metal bands that had really aggressively like Norris God-inspired cover art. Oh, yeah. It's just that. It's a guy emerging from a bowl of flames. But, I mean, like, he's great. I think that Lady Sif is interesting. I think the uh, 042 Valkyrie that we're getting, dual bolt, zero range, 70 points, 10, 11, 18, 3. She walks. She's got charge. She has a special attack power. She's got that uh, defense, the invulnerability again, and a blank damage. But she can reduce pen damage by non-adjacent characters. She can reduce damage from adjacent characters by one. I mean, that's pretty interesting and i think that's at least from my memory the first time we've seen that but then her dragon fang and gear special attack power that she starts with first four clicks blades great like it on a charge piece like the ability to roll potentially more than her three printed damage but she can use it if targeting up to two characters and she has two bolts and she rolls a separate d6 for each hit character like yeah i know there was a lot of people that were like oh man dual bolts for close this is great Oh, but I'm bummed that I can't roll blades and divide. Well, guess what? This is one better. You get to roll blades twice. Like, it's 70 points. Sure, a little steep. And the back three clicks uh, might as well not even be there for how boring they are. But uh, the first four, I think that's a really cool addition to an, Agar as, an Asgardians or even an Exiles team. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know the specific Valkyrie. Obviously, like, real name unknown. So I don't know where at in comics like this one specifically comes in or if this is supposed to be like real name various kind of situation. But um, I really do enjoy the dual target blades, especially with it being top dial. It's a standard charge piece. This will probably see most of its play in sealed, but it's going to be Absolutely. like a real fun casual piece to like just throw out there. You know, if you can take a hit, I mean, obviously, she's built to take a hit. If you can do that and then still manage to hit a Blades roll, that's pretty sweet. Or if you get the first hit off, that's also, like, going to be pretty fun. Um, and, yeah, it gives you... It doesn't really give you, like, two chances at Blades, but at the same time, it does. So, like, if one of your Blades rolls is just nothing good, if it's, like, a one or a two, uh, you'll still do two, two damage, but... Um, 
if your other one like hits like a six, you know, it's quite a bit cooler. Um, and it's also really nice to see whiz kids in the, you know, um, almost immediate first year of changing powers now coming out with things that kind of support those changes. Like right. you have dual target blades. You can only use against one close target. Hey, I mean, sure. It's the tail end of the year, but here's a figure that can do it. And I think that's neat. Yeah, for sure. Uh, another character in the set that can do dual target and is mostly a close character is blade. So blade is a very boring dial. I'm going to, you know, he's charged blades uh, for his top three clicks and then he gets flurry his top three clicks. He's got 11 attacks, um, 18 defense with toughness for the first two clicks and then goes on to combat reflexes. He does have a click of regen. His sixth click his last click is an eight speed with flurry 10 attack with no attack power, an 18 defense with regen, and a 3 damage. And that click is important because he has nothing else on his dial, but he does have a single trait, and that's Rally 5, opposing attack rolls. He has traded Steel Energy from that, so his whole dial essentially is Steel Energy. Um, but for a 5 on opposing, or no, yeah, 5 on opposing rolls, uh, when Blade would be KO'd by an opposing character, you may instead remove one of Blade's rally dies, and if you do, you turn him to click 6, Protected Pulse Wave. Um, essentially, obviously there's way to KO characters that aren't opposing by opposing character effects. Uh, so, like, if he crit missed on click 6, or... Um, if I mean, there's there's several effects that could do it. It's just this is one of those things where in like a battle royal setting, if I get past like two blades, I'm pulling both of them because I'm gonna stack those red fives, and you're just gonna have two characters that are annoyingly like decent stats and cannot die for half of the game. Uh, like the opposing roles just really roll in on battle royal settings. Um, even in like sealed. I'd probably play this guy in a heartbeat. Like, it's a really fun... He's a team player, team ability, six range, two lightning bolts. Like, he's probably never shooting, but, you know, on the off chance that I do, uh, it's a solid figure for such, like, a terribly boring dial. It's, like, surprisingly interesting and fun for me. Yeah, and we've seen how uh, effective and how much of a pain things like the Living Legend traits can be. This, I mean, it takes a dice, sure, but this is essentially the same thing. And like you said, you stack two of them. You now need to waste three attacks to actually kill this guy. Like, that's yeah. annoying. And that's assuming he doesn't get a chance to, like, flurry steel energy in between, you know. Um, his whole dial, he's got three damage. So there's most of the time he's not, you know, with the exception of that Valkyrie we just talked about, most characters aren't reducing close attack damage by three. So he's going to get one through and be able to heal most of the time. Um, yeah. And I, th I think I had enough experience with Colossus stacking rally dies in a battle Royale setting and just sitting on like six impervious rolls that I had to eat through. And after seeing that, like I, I look at this and I'm like, yeah, that's got some potential. I don't think it's competitive in any aspect, but it's definitely got some potential, uh, whether it be a casual build that you put together or sealed or battle royals or whatever um it's definitely a figure that you don't want to just gloss over for no reason i think uh we all undervalued how often rally die would actually come up and be a thing and i've been teaching a friend to play over the last year his first big set that he bought into was rise and fall and the amount of times that i've been like okay well this game's going on 20 extra minutes because of your colossus and these rally die yeah, it's it's a real thing. It's not a guaranteed thing, but when it is, yeah, it's obnoxious. <laughs> the most obnoxious thing is when you manage to damage Colossus, uh, or you manage to like hit him, but you give him another rally die, and so then he spends one while gaining one. Like that was like, it's like, oh man, this is just never gonna end. This trade is just so awful. Speaking uh, of never going to go ahead, uh, the last figure. And I think that this is probably the most, uh, oof, what would it be? The most Saturday morning Simeon Bruce looking sculpt that I've ever seen. Uh, 030, <laughs> Donald Blake. Yeah. It's a, what a Donald Blake. What an but, 
amount. Yeah, he's just a man. Mess, has. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's lucky he's sure it's supposed sharp to be. because what? Donald Blake's like one bad outfit away from looking like he's begging for change. It's a windy day up on those signs. But <laughs> it is super cool to see another three bolts, zero range, charge quake piece. Um, none of that is something that I care about. Cosmic energy, okay, great. You ensure that, I don't know, he's always going to be able to charge and quake, I guess. None of that's important. What's important about this character? His 90 point value, also no. His back three clicks of flurry blade super senses, absolutely not. His mediocre, I don't know, color coordination for his outfit. Uh, I don't think any of these things are important, but the reason why he'll be fun and the reason why he'll hopefully see some sealed play if you're in a place that can do sealed wow man no more thors his trait when donald blake makes a close attack his targets can't use defense powers cool so yeah. i don't need to burn wit i don't need to worry about positioning i don't need to leave someone vulnerable out just to have line and be able to manage with do i do penetrating is this a, you just don't use defense powers like this guy Admittedly, 90 points, big investment. It's almost a third of your team. But imagine him being your follow-up attacker. 90 points isn't what you want for your second string attacker, but you cripple someone. Maybe you cripple two figures. Maybe you even get lucky enough to wing three. Now he runs in, and he doesn't have to worry about defenses. He doesn't have to worry about stop clicks. Like All of that stuff just goes out the window. Yeah, I'll take that power. That's, that's all right. Battle Royal, sealed casual stuff if i'm trying to make a team of aggressive homeless looking people like yeah i'll throw them on all those <laughs> yeah i i agree this is um for an uncommon this guy has a lot of like punch to give uh combine him with like a couple empowers or like you know whatever you want to do uh power gem like you know stuff like that like this guy could definitely clean up in some casual games on his own uh any click that and especially i should say um, with shape change still technically being benched and not having to worry about it most of the time, this will get rid of most of your opponent's rollouts. There's not a lot of rollouts that this like won't just negate. Uh, obviously, three damage isn't great, but essentially, if you charge into a group of people and quake, um, this is like some weird OG Nova Blast damage kind of stuff going on. You know, he's he's dealing. Uh, two pen or not two pen even it's just two damage through whatever defense they have even if they have like invincible or whatever it's just going like straight through if they have stop clicks you know whatever um he's not as cool as like exodus being able to get through like stop clicks and stuff uh but he is like one of those other like silver bullets that we kind of have an option for getting through stop clicks and yeah i mean technically with three damage, he's probably never going to do that. And being 90 points, that's probably too much of an investment. But, you know, we haven't seen the full set. There might be some Asgardian swap coming up. He might be like a sideline option. Uh, we never know. Yeah, there might be some Asgardians coming up in this set. <laughs> There's probably at least one or two left, I swear. Uh, but that's all we're going to talk about of the set. Of course, we'll be back to do a full set breakdown when we get the full set list. We'll do an actual review. Um, but before we end the conversation as far as what Mr. Scott Porter unboxed, he did unbox a lot of information, not so much Dial's information, but uh, we do have the full legacy card list. So out of the Hammer of Thor set, which I think was a safe bet that there was going to be some stuff pulled from there, we have Fandral, of course, of the Warriors 3. We have Beta Ray Bill, Hogan, Thor, and Loki, the duo figure, Volstag, and then the mail away figure, I think Thor's Mighty Chariot. So a pretty decent little offering there alone. I really like that beta ray. I do have the Thor's Mighty Chariot, and we've seen people asking for kind of ridiculous amounts online for it. As of this point, we don't really know what it does or what it's going to do, the legacy card that is. Uh, that's the I, best time to sell your figure when people want lots of money yeah. and don't know that it's trash because it, it the legacy card might very well just be uh, like a complete garbage thing to be honest Thor's Mighty Chariot I mean obviously it was 500 points and that was the only point value um, 
I never played it in a 500 or like even like thousand point game. It does not pull its weight for 500 points. It's a cool sculpt oh, no. and it's an interesting like dial, but it does not pull its weight. I've played it in like a 600 point game with some Asgardian like support. And even then with like duo attack and stuff, uh, Volstag on the other hand, I think is a really cool, super rare, uh, really awesome, interesting piece. Uh, the Thor and Loki duo figure uh, depends on like you know how they how these legacy cards come out. So far, the only legacy card we've seen is from Avengers Defenders War, and that is the Valkyrie Super Rare, which I think I still have. I don't know, uh, but there was three. There was Black Knight, Valkyrie, and Ghost Rider were the three peanut base Ram figures from that set. Um, of course, they were all like super rares. But uh, we've seen what that Valkyrie does. I don't find it super impressive for 50 points, but, you know, the dial is up online if you want to check it out and, you know, try and collect that old Super Rare. And then the remaining figures are all from the Mighty Um, Thor set. Why did they do this? (laughs) So we got Pile Driver, Bulldozer, and Thunderball. Of course, somehow missing the Wrecker. Um, It'll be interesting. Because uh, Pile Driver Bulldozer did not have equipments. Wrecker did. He's not being uh, legacy carded. But then Thunderball had an equipment. So is Thunderball going to get his old equipment like somehow retroactively attached to him? Maybe they just give him a trait that gives him the same text as that power. Obviously, there's no legacy card for that equipment. So if they attach it to him in some way, it'll be through the legacy card only. Um and then for a first, obviously Thor's Mighty Chariot's a two by two, but for a first outside of that, we have two Colossal Retaliators, one that was definitely used and then one that was never used. So we've got Surtur and Ymir. Um, obviously Surtur had the the weakness to the end cap. Ymir had a weakness to energy explosion, uh, heat miser, snow miser, however they may be. Surtur, of course, was played because he his retaliation ignored stop clicks. It ignored defense powers, period, um, which included stop clicks. And then it dealt one pen to like everyone within a range afterwards. And then Ymir, I think his retal was like an end cap. I, I could look it up. Um, I'll do that real quick because I honestly never played Ymir for his retail. Uh, stop toughness with an 18 defense. Uh, so he could make a close attack, the chosen character, and all other opposing characters within four squares, which is pretty decent uh, in line of fire. Then do so. Instead of normal damage, give each hit character two action tokens that don't deal pushing damage. For 25 points, I'm kind of surprised they didn't get used more often. Obviously, they'll have to really shake up what he does now because that's super lame with power cosmic and uh, giant size granting the willpower rolls. I feel like giving somebody two actions without pushing damage. Obviously, pushing damage isn't a thing anymore, but uh, two action tokens is not the big threat that it used to be. But yeah, that's that's all of the figures that you need to be looking out for if Obviously, these are mostly sold out online unless you want to pay real big bucks now when you're listening to this. But if you have some Hammer of Thor sitting around in a box, if you have that Avengers Defenders War Valkyrie, or you just have most of the Mighty Thor, I have all of the Mighty Thor stuff. I've got about half of the Hammer of Thor stuff, and I think I might have the Avengers Defenders War Valkyrie. Um, So now we're just playing the waiting game of seen the legacy cards to see if the new dials or powers match up to anything even remotely competitive it'll be really interesting because those warriors three figures they all used to benefit they were all uniques i guess they all are still uniques but they used to benefit off of having the other warriors on the map but they also had just trash back half dials they went from being like hey i'm a charge piece i'm a flurry piece to just no movement powers, no attack powers, maybe a reducer or a defense mod, sometimes a damage power. But then like Volstag ends 11 for four, but he's pretty much just a naked dial. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how much they're going to have to reduce the point costs if they do, what sort of traits they can put in. Like you mentioned with the equipment, hopefully they do not introduce equipment uh, getting legacy carded in if you're going to do it. 
put it in as a trade, cool. But then also, and this would just be the best birthday present to me, whiz kids. Uh, what if they brought back those two colossals and they weren't retaliators? I think that'd be oh, man. the best case scenario. If the so obviously we saw the colossal sentinels, um, which had like different wording wording, but those those sentinels were never retaliators. But I think it'd be hilarious if um, people are shelling out big bucks for Surter assuming he's going to work the same way he did and then it was like a legacy card that only gave him like a a 200 and like 400 point line or something like that and no retaliation like on either value i think that'd be pretty funny and also i mean it'd just be decent for the game we already have surters in the game already i mean we we've got the fulcum abominus uh we've got you know a bunch of stuff to get around that i mean that that Donald Blake we just talked about can technically do the same thing Surter here used to a slightly varied version and obviously for way more points. Um, but yeah, I, I really don't want to return to the 2018 scene of seeing like two or three Surters on the back half of my opponent's line with obviously shiny legacy cards for this time around. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think that'd be awesome. I'm interested uh, they've definitely piqued my curiosity. I will say, instead of Thor's Mighty Chariot, I would have loved to have seen the, uh, what is it, 3 by 6 uh, Serpent. Obviously, that card would have had to have been much different. It wouldn't have just been a single-sided card like most of these will be. Um, but, yeah. It's cool that they, they chose some figures. Like, Thor's Mighty Chariot might have been a little bit harder to get back in the day. Um most of these are just super rare or lower. And then Surter and Ymir, I don't think Surter ever dropped below like about 50 bucks, even once he hit Golden Age, because there was over. I mean, and once Silver popped back up in option, uh, Surter was on like the watch list, but was definitely like a part of Silver. So I think Surter's always kind of been there as like a decent option. It's just, you know, now he's there even longer, and we'll see and what kind of capacity he ends up filling. I feel that, uh, especially with that Thor's Mighty Chariot too, a lot of people might not realize how hard, even in their initial release, some of these figures were to get. And so when you see people posting things like $200, which uh, PSA to the community, don't pay $200 for a figure. Don't ever pay $200 for a figure. Especially if you you don't know what it does yet. Yeah. Especially if you don't know what it does. If you... I don't know uh, if your godparent is uh, maybe a old gooey black slime version of a uh, I don't know war times vet with weird magnetism powers or something, and you want to pay two hundred dollars for that emotional attachment, sure. But two hundred bucks for anything in this game is bananas. And if you don't know what it does, don't do it. It's just a waste of money. I even think, in popular opinion. Uh, pre-ordering, unless you know what the entire set does, is also silly. There's yeah, yeah. nothing to benefit from. It's almost always going to be accessible in the time in between set reveals and putting in a pre-order. And if it's not, I'm sorry, people have different sit- situations. I understand that. But um, yeah, those figures, those Hammer of Thor figures, it was really hard to come by. The game had just come back from being gone for quite a while. That was the set and... that was designed prior to tops selling whiz kids. So Correct. the fact that that set actually ever got released, like they had that set ready to like release and go and then they were sold and like the game essentially died. It's pretty crazy that like any of that stuff actually ended up getting made. Um, that being said, like it is a great set to return via um, this probably, you know, given there's 12 this is probably my favorite legacy card list that I've seen just because it shows like an actual, you know, not only is there like the Thor and Loki duo figure, which couldn't have been hard or couldn't have been easy for them to uh, do a legacy card for. Uh, but then they were like, you know what, we're going to do the Warriors three. And then we're also going to do the wrecking crew minus the wrecker. Um, you know, we're going to grab choice. Valkyrie. We're going to grab beta Ray bill. And not just like, you know, the easy, we'll take the chase from uh, the mighty Thor set, Beta Ray Bill. Thankfully, they didn't do that. That would have really hurt my pocketbook. 
because I, I sold that guy a couple years back, and I still really regret it. Uh, Thor's Mighty Chariot. What a weird shot in the dark they did with that one. But I'm glad. I'm like, you know, these are actually, they're exciting to me. They're actual, like, figures that, in my opinion, are kind of iconic in their own rights. Uh, Thor's Mighty Chariot, iconic as a shelf piece and pretty much nothing else for me. Uh, But those original Warriors 3, they could have gone with the ones from Mighty Thor, but they were like, nah, let's let's reach back to, like, those OG Hammer of Thor ones. Um, Yeah, doing Surtur and Ymir, while I don't necessarily like that, those are figures that are actually, I mean... Surtur and Ymir, obviously very important to like the Thor canon and storyline. So yeah. It's uh it's also good. And I mean, again, this is another uh small golf clap for WizKids. It's good to see that they realized printing cards doesn't cost them anything extra, and they're reviving figures that fit the theme. Not going to dump on past figures or past themes, but if this was only legacy cards for thor figures i think i'd be bored most of them you'd look at and be like i don't even want to play that like that's yeah. not that interesting it was like one, and like it, two what if thors uh yeah. one from fear itself uh yeah not looking at you wonder woman legacy card set but at the same time kind of looking at you wonder woman legacy id card set. you want to give me a hulked out thor legacy card i would have been okay with that okay. Uh, that figure very funny but um, yeah, I think this is a good representation of things throughout Thor's mythology. I think 12 is a really good number. Uh, hopefully they do the third great thing with legacy cards, which is stop making them meta cards, because it's already hard enough going and finding some of these old figures. But now telling people that want to be involved in that scene that this is a necessity, like, ugh, uh, ugh, I don't know how I, I feel about that, but it's erring towards not great. So yeah, give me the give me the Warriors three. Give me this weird better Ray Bill who uh, clicking, 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 clicking gets. Oh wow, he gets really low. He gets down to a fifteen toughness, Simeon. <laughs> yeah. toughness. He's got three clicks in a row of fifteen. So, so it I doesn't have matter how long it is. I have that beta Ray, but I have the Fast Forces from the Galactic Guardians version, which is the exact same sculpt. But in my opinion, a much different and slightly much better um, <laughs> figure. So <laughs> he's got two clicks of impervious instead of the one. And then, uh, yeah, his bottom dial does not reach a 14 defense. Instead, it stops a little bit short at the 15 defense toughness. So, yeah, they really didn't give Beta Ray. I mean, honestly, they've never given Beta Ray Bill any love except for the That's Mighty crazy. Thor like stupid good chase um and i still i still think that chase is just really solid i'm surprised he didn't see more play uh but what a good figure i think that one actually might have been a champion figure i can't remember but um yeah probably one of the low points in my career when i sold that i sold it for way too much money uh but at the same time i'm like man if i only could have not sold it and just kept it. Um, but on that's... the top low points in you know Thor related things, do we need to spend any time ragging on the actual aesthetic of a lot of these figures? Do we just leave it on? Uh, Congratulations, <laughs> for a good legacy card set. No, I look we'll, forward to we'll having... save that for when we cover the set as a whole. I'm still holding out hope that there might be some real winners at this point we've seen most of the commons and uncommons i think we've actually seen all of the commons uh i will just say yeah they're they're not winning any awards for like miniatures of the year with these sculpts uh obviously you know commons and uncommons we're not looking for like super dynamic stuff but who boy is there some just real bland kind of stuff going on? Who knows? Maybe they will give a couple uh, really standout sleeper unboxings to uh, random people that are going to open them online in their car and film them while wearing open toe sandals or something like that. Maybe <laughs> maybe that's where the good figure will come out. Obviously, yes. That's either that or uh, like some other country will spoil all of the figures in one go, which 
I also appreciate, you know, I shouldn't say that WizKids has a plan, but at least they, you know, if it happens now, Scott Porter was able to unbox his stuff first. So, you know, it's all, I really hope it's all gravy. After knows, this. Oh, yeah. And I, re I really hope that Scott Porter knows how good he is for the community um, and how lucky, I hope that the community knows how lucky we are to have Scott Porter, uh, not sucking up to the famous guy or anything, but he's enthusiastic. And I don't think that I have met, you know, a half dozen people that have as much just general knowledge about anything they're playing as he has about everything that he's opening. Is he researching stuff before? Maybe, but he seems passionate. Him going on about wanting to be Nova, he's a. Uh, it, it could be so much worse. We could be paying we WizKids. Um, that wasn't me admitting that I'm a part of WizKids. Never would I ever, especially in court, admit to that. Um, no, but like we could be having or seeing WizKids pay someone to get online and give us fake musings about uh, being enthused about a product. But instead, we get Scott. And I think that even though the set is something that I'm not personally stoked on, I had a great time watching his unboxings, and I'm looking forward to the Disney Plus unboxings in a few weeks. Oh, yeah. I feel like those are going to be really good. Um, yeah, Scott always knocks it out of the park. Obviously, I don't always have the time to watch, what is it, like five 50-ish minute videos. Um, but I always catch like the last three because those tend to be shorter. You know, obviously, he puts like whatever commons or uncommons he's already pulled to the side. Uh, but yeah. I think he's great for the community. Anyone that doesn't think so, I think just, you know, I, I have seen people say like, you know, he's just acting or he's just like pretending to have knowledge and it's all a script. But I honestly don't think that that's even close to true. I think that he's a huge uh, like geek. He's a huge nerd and he just really loves comics and he really loves this game. Probably not in the same capacity that a lot of us do. Uh, obviously he's like a pretty busy dude, but at the end of the day, I think he just really likes opening the products and, you know, seeing him gush about like characters that he read about in like this series or whatever, obviously, you know, like all father Odin or whatever the, like the Odin armor with Stark is a pretty iconic looking thing. And it's a cool, like dial design and stuff. So, uh, seeing him really like get surprised and excited about stuff like that. Cause we might have seen these like sculpts and stuff, but I doubt Scott's trolling like the game trade forums uh, or game trade magazine or like hero clicks forums to try and find out like what's in a set before he unboxes it. And so when he sees it, he's definitely seeing this stuff for like the first time. Um, Absolutely. But if anyone thinks that pretty much yeah. uh, bring us to a close for this episode, give I'll give Luke one chance to, to shout out any other venue or uh, maybe, I don't know, do you have like a Tumblr or a uh, deviant art that you might want to send people towards? <laughs> I don't know. Wow. I mean, not only do I have a Tumblr, I have seven Tumblrs. No. Um, <laughs> honestly, I think I mentioned venues and folks and places and things. The one thing I would love to kind of just put some spotlight attention on, man, oh man, I think a lot of us, uh, we, we really get caught up in, in playing the game at whatever speed we play at. If you have the opportunity and if you're, like, if you're able to safely, wherever you live, whatever your situation is, try and teach someone to play the game. You will play figures that you don't care about. You will really refresh yourself on if you know the rules as well as you think you do. But you'll just get a new appreciation for the game by teaching someone else how to play, seeing them go through the learning curve, having them ask you questions that you might have assumed were just common knowledge. You'll become a, a better player. You'll become a better teacher through it. And honestly, it's also going to expand the player base of the game. And if you want to keep playing the game, get more people in the game. Not a lot of people are out there pounding the pavement uh, promoting hero clicks. So you tell one person a day how to play, and then they tell one person... And I think by the end of the month, we have 100% uh, U.S. conversion or something. I don't know. I've actually never looked at the data for how things like a hypothetical game teaching virus might spread. But I think if you only infect one person with the love of hero clicks, I'm pretty sure we can get at least 80% of the country in on this game before Disney Plus comes out. I mean, 
I'm hoping by the time Disney Plus comes out that like there's Super Bowl ads, there's like you know, I think Disney is really gonna throw the absolute book at Hero Clicks and as far Joking as like that, advertising goes. Um, if and... you have Disney Plus, can you imagine logging onto Disney Plus and you just have a carousel ad that just shows you a couple figures from the Disney Plus Hero Clicks set? And then if you click that, it takes you to WizKid's site. Even if that just happened un, like unpromoted, if it was just kind of up there casually, I think that would be a great thing to see. But yeah, I, I, I would love to yeah. not necessarily shout out anyone in particular, but uh, just shout out the community and say that you're all incredibly capable and valuable members of the community. And I think that you should share that and this game that we all love or begrudgingly love uh, with some other people. And if that's a friend, a coworker, someone that you think is really nerdy or geeky in a specific area, like anything that people like with pop culture comic stuff, there's a hero clicks figure to represent that. Find out what someone's into. Show them that uh, Dark Knight Batman figure who's two clicks away from having a heart attack. Get them into the game through something like that. They don't care that it's old and retired. Like that could be someone's great first experience. And that's a really cool thing to be able to give a person. And I think every person listening, every person in the Discord, uh, we all have that within us. And it's nothing but positive for the game. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, I think the game has kind of gotten stagnant and uh, I'm not going to say that that's on like any fault of a player base, but now that a lot of venues, at least stateside, there's quite a few venues that are starting to open up. Um, I know like my venue specifically, we've gotten uh, about three new players in the last couple months. And like, while that's not great, it is like a good start. And uh, slowly, I, you know, I think we can build it. Um, and if you want to join the discord, like Luke here, if you want to someday perhaps reach the same ranks as super fan, uh, you can, you can just drop on to our Patreon and, uh, you know, I think that we do a decent job of giving value to people. Uh, it's not just, you know, you give us money, you get nothing in return. You get entered in sweepstakes, you get dice and tokens, you get stickers, you can get shirts, you can get all kinds of stuff. I don't really know. I don't really handle that stuff. That's all Calder, but I've been told that it's a pretty sweet deal. I have yet to receive any of it, and I've been paying since day one, um, at least of my tenure. But that's an option. And then included with that, you get to jump into our Discord where you can listen to fun things like the blooper sodes, which is mostly just me making Calder sound really bad, and that's fun. Uh, you get to see all of the kids from South Dakota that have recently invaded the Discord and uh, oh, wow. like to just make fun of Calder and dress up like him, I guess. Uh, I, I don't know. They're like, they're Calder playing, cause, calls Dollar playing. I don't know. That's a hard combination of words. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a fun time, and I think you get a decent amount of value out of it. So that is my, my singular plug for the Discord. Um, come back next week and you'll hear Calder do a much better version of that. And then, uh, like always, we are sponsored by CoolStuffInc.com where you can find cool stuff in stock every day. I will tell you, I don't think you can find any of these legacy card figures in there. They've all been bought up for sure. But, uh, you know, you can find uh, some new stuff, some not so old stuff. You can you can find new figures that will someday be legacy cards. Who knows down the line? Twelve years from now, you might be pulling a figure that's going to be a legacy card. Uh, but yeah, check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. So if you're looking for emotional satisfaction, my advice to you is seek professional... Hero clicks. No. Are you serious? Again? How many people even play this game? Like the hundred? Instant deadpan humor. Oh, how they, uh, six how people work? think I am funny. It's a hard day's work. Not that you know anything about that. Which... Absolute fools, it's not richer nonsense. I'm gonna make hero clips like that forever. Are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, Google, attack someone. Let's attack Simeon because he's a jerk. That's true.